I mean, we talk at terms that the dance can, this mate of mine, he was in the area, but he was in Belgium or France or somewhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was an armourer when I was an electrician, and uh, because I'd been grounded then. I mean, I only did about three or four months training as a pilot, and mm-hmm. I got grounded, like, because I got defective muscle balance. After I crashed the tiger moth, I got defective <laughs> muscle balance in my left eye, and so I was grounded. And then I had to be retrained. I mean, because I was in the RAF VR, I was a volunteer reservist. And because of that, I could have gone out if once they'd grounded me. Mm-hmm. Say, well, you've got the option of going out, but you like if you go out, you like to be called up so many. Yeah. So it's if you're as well remustering mm-hmm. as something else, and we've got these vacancies, which do you want to be? I'm an electrician or what? So I plumped for being an electrician, and uh, so I went to Cranfield at Cardington to train as an electrician for three months and I came out as an electrician on Spitfires then for the rest of the world. Mm. Mm. One of the events, one of the few events I remember about the war, well, there's certain things episodes in the war that you vividly remember, yeah. like Nora will remember certain episodes. But one of the first things I remember is when when I was still on pilot training, I went down to um, a, a reception centre down in Brighton. And it was down there, I was down at Brighton when my father died. And I got, I was sent home on compassionate leave. And then when I came back, the squadron I was with had gone to Rhodesia for uh, crew training, you see. And I missed it. And I was put then with the University Air Squadron. Well, I was a, a, mm. like a baby now, it's not bad with this one. Mm. Because they were all upper class types. Mm. They were far better spoken than I was, because I was just one of the lads from Yorkshire, you know. And a lot of these have, have been to eat, Oxford and places mm. like that, you know. And I was completely, I think this is what helped to ground me eventually. Because I just couldn't cope with the, the that sort of a life they were leading. Mm. Not not educationally, because they were so far in advance of me. I mean, I, I, I'd i done trigonometry and things like that, but I'd only done it through night school. Yeah. I hadn't done it through part of grammar school and university mm. training, you see. Mm. And I mean, they could do this... That, this that what I call dead reckoning navigation, using a Mercator chart and, and dr- tracks with with a straight line and then working out your windage and all that sort of thing. They could do triangular forces in the red, but I could start and work it all out and use a, a slide rule and things like that. You know, and that, it, it all, none of it really helped. But anyway, when I was at Brighton, <coughs> We were, we were actually stationed in the Grand Hotel at Brighton, where Maggie Thatcher got bombed, yeah. you know. Well, we were in rooms in that Grand Hotel, and the, that, the, all the staircase had been boarded over, because it was like a marble staircase. It'd been done, done over with floorboards. There'd be about 200 out of the <laughs> crew getting out to training in, the, in this Grand Hotel. And we used to do navigation lessons in the Metropole, which was next door. Yeah. And this metropole was the same, all bare boards. And they'd had hard board put on top of them, mm-hmm. everything. And there was a damn big painting in the grand, on top of this fancy double staircase in the Grand Hotel. And they couldn't deck it out to put it in a bomb-proof place. It was so big. So it was boarded over with floorboard and things like that. Oh, well, if I'd bombed it that, it would have still blown it to bits, wouldn't it? You know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, we were there, and when we saw up on the roof, there were these brown, uh, browning guns, four browning guns on the Motley Stoke Mountain, you know, the old and swivelled round and shooter. And it, there were sandbags round them. And I thought, first day I was there, I thought, well, that's fucking what they're doing, just defence. And every 40 yards on the coast, there was a Bofors gun. And the, the piers had been blown up the first 20 or 30 yards all along the south coast, the piers were blown up. 
so that if they got any of yeah. horses landed, they couldn't get, you couldn't just land yeah. boats and then walk straight on to land. Mm. Uh. The, the last 20 or 30 yards would have to swim. So they demolished the first 20 or 30 right. yards of any pier. Oh. So all these piers had been half demolished and there were these Bofors guns and apparently it was a Canadian regiment who were manning these Bofors guns. The second day we were there, we <laughs> just were waking up in the, at this, the view rattling, and now we're not in a better plane, two Fock Wolf 190s were over shooting hell out, <laughs> out in the front of the promenade, you know, and these both were going bang, 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 <laughs> they operated at about oh, 20 or 30 shots a minute, you know, boom, boom. They were like 40 millimetre cannon shells that were coming out of Well, we looked at each other, you know, because I'd just come down by train, you know, from, I'd been at, at, at London when I got the message to go home on compact mm. leave. And I come back down to Brighton and joined this new squad, you know, and they'd already been there a week. And while well, I'd been at home with my dad's funeral and everything. And I come <laughs> the tail of this lot. When he went out on the parade, he had to have a fellow with a whistle w watching out to sea. Mm -hmm. And if there was any sign of anything coming in from the sea, the legal situation was that if they came in with the wheels down, and showing the colour of the day, nobody shot at them. Yeah. But if they didn't, if anything came in a normal sea level approach, knocking on, they got shot at with these Bofors guns. Mm. And we had to man these drowning guns on top of the hotel roof. And it was your, whatever, when your turn was, a sergeant would take you up. And we hadn't done any gunnery training or anything like that by that. We'd only been in the area for about yeah. three months. So, and he, and he s said, now then he said, the ruling is, he says, that if you see anything like that, you shoot at them. He said, but if you take my advice, he says, you won't even attempt to shoot at them while they're coming in from the sea. He said, if you do, he says, they'll blow you off the top of the roof. <laughs> he says they've got cannon. He says they've got cannon shells and, and machine guns. He says that'll demolish this roof off here if they decide there's something to fire at. Yeah. He says because all these are that the fellas doing the the final air training yeah. over there, and they're sending them over here to shoot up the towns they can do, and they'll get a bit of practicing for shooting at us fellas, you know. And they used to go around and they dropped, they dropped two 500 pound bombs and strafed everything with these machine guns and they were back. Five minutes later there'd be a couple of Spitfires and they came, come over after them. Well they'd all be, they'd be landing and having the breakfast by, by the time they <laughs> picked up with them, you know. And they were the, the latest German fighters with these Fock Wolf 190s. You could recognise them straight away. And you could see the damn big swastikas on them, you know, as they were coming over the promenade in between these hotels, you know. Because right. they came in three foot off the water. You could have, couldn't see or hear anything till they were all on, all on top of you, you know. And when we were practicing drilling outside yeah. of the promenade, we had these air raid shelters every 50 yards or so, and all over the place. And we were designated certain shelters, and you didn't march anywhere other than a fair distance. And every time you went out on a flight, a fellow would be there with a whistle, looking out to sea, and if you saw anything coming on, he'd blow this whistle, and you're, whatever you're doing, shot into the air, shouting, you know. <laughs>